Oh dear. What? You should have added that in there. Okay. That would have been awesome. So are we, are we calling it Elders Rising? I think that's as good as anything. It's recording right now. We're on oh. live. We're, the world is knowing us. The world is knowing us? Not biblically. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, now I have to edit that out. Oh, why? I don't know. Oh. Well, okay. people should have a sense of humor. <laughs> um, let me open up my notes. Is that, a, is that bothering you while you're driving? No, you're fine. I think that this deafening silence bothers everybody that's going to listen to this. <laughs> all two, three people, maybe. Uh, uh, all both of them. <laughs> okay, intro. So, m- my thoughts were, um, we'll start with, like, what we're, what the purpose of why we're starting this podcast. What is the whole reason? Now, what um, would you say that you're, drove you to this, Mitch? Well, you brought it up to me, what, a month or two ago, uh-huh. about doing a podcast. Um... And then a couple of weeks ago, we went to that presentation of prophets and the Constitution. And it was talking about the importance of the Constitution and its doctrinal place in in the church, right? Uh-huh. That's what it was all about. And one of the things that they said in, in that after the video was they said... Um, it's been prophesied that the elders of the church will rise up and save the Constitution. But in order for that to happen, there has to be at least some elders who know and understand the Constitution. And I have spent my entire adult life studying and coming to try and understand the Constitution and our founding documents as they were intended by the founders when they were written, not by our standards and understanding and definitions as today because that is wrong and immoral to try and judge and decipher something then by today's intent by twisted and perverted men to try and limit our freedoms and what we can say and what we can do. That's one of the things that I remember back when when I got back from, from my mission and you were back from Iraq. And I, I think it was about that time you gave me a pocket constitution. Do you remember that? Nope. You just gave it to me. You pulled it out of your pocket. And you're like, hey, have this, Fred. And I'd never had a pocket constitution. And it was like, I remember it being impressed upon me, like, how much you appreciated that. And we were like, it was before we were married. It was before we had, we were still punk kids, you know, somewhat a little bit more mature. But <laughs> we were both like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And... I just, I, I remember that, and, and I still have it. I still carry it with me in my backpack for my work stuff. And it's just one of those things that's like, it's, if, it's a, if it's a document that really is, we, we hold up as, as an inspired document, scripture, why do we not pay attention to it? Why do we not read it? Why do we not defend it, you know? Yeah, well, that's just the thing. I think a lot of people have a hard time uh, connecting those dots together that yes we know in the church that it was an inspired document that it was he- it was um, there was help from Moroni to to write the constitution and not just the constitution but the bill of rights the the declaration of independence all that and I think a lot of people have a hard time connecting those dots that if it is an inspired document and if it is um, it's inspired by the hand of God or one of his angels, it is just that, it's scripture. And that's the way that we need to treat treat it. We need to study it, we need to understand it like we would our scriptures. And I'll be honest, I'm not the best at studying my scriptures like I should be, but, you know, I have studied the Constitution, I know enough about the Gospel, I know enough about, about the Church to know that the the importance of the Constitution and our freedoms here going hand in hand with one another. They are one and the same. All throughout the Book of Mormon, they talk about freedom. The whole church is based on um, freedom to choose. 
Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, individual liberty. The same principles, the same foundation that this nation was built upon. The right to choose, to choose your own your own destiny, to build your life that you want to and earn your eternal rewards. And that's what it's all about. Both of them go hand in hand. It's interesting how, so it's, a, it's an idea that I've had and I didn't know most ideas aren't original like it's very rare that there is a truly original idea and it's an idea i don't know where it came from in my mind but it's something that's been kicking around in my mind for over a decade it's really for a long time but it's this concept that the war in heaven that fight for agency that we had is still going on today and you look at sin and the parallels with sin and it chains you down you look at you look at our agency and all the commandments that god gives us are to help us to preserve our our own agency and when it said that that movie that we watched the other day what um what was the title there's a uh, prophets and the constitution prophets and the constitution it it said explicitly there and it was like to me it was like hearing somebody from an, a completely outside source reaffirming something that you've had in your mind for for years and years thinking like okay that's there's there's something to that that was a really neat moment for me to realize hey that's that's that that that's that battle satan is still trying to win and and god's already won it but we're just deciding where we're at with it you know whose side we're on yeah well then that's that's the way that i've explained it to to my mom the other day we were talking about it and we've been saying that for a long time that it's just everything here is just a continuation of the war in heaven it's just the wars that we have here on this earth they may be separate instances separate reasons um, in the mortal mind in the mortal sense why we're fighting those wars and, and whatnot but in reality it's just other battles other battles of the same war So how, I guess the question next is, how does that, this idea, this, this, this need for us to preserve and to, to protect the Constitution and this need for us to, to fight for agency and liberty and freedom, how does this tie into like the podcast itself? Like what, what, is, what do you hope to gain from the, the podcast? Uh, well, I'm hoping to, to help other, other members of the church, not just, not just the the men but also the women realizing the importance of it and teaching it to our children because that's a big issue that we have Um, I can talk to people just about anybody anywhere and most of them don't really know what's in the constitution what's what's not in there and they say well I know my rights well really you don't Mm -hmm. unless you've gone through and you've spent the time and the effort in reading this and understanding this and relating it to you personally you don't know and you're not going to know unless you do so that uh, I'm hoping to uh, to help inform other people as to what is in there and you know reignite that spark one and things, hopefully learn something for myself too yeah absolutely that's one of the things I've always respected you and is your knowledge of the Constitution and like you said he's like Oh, I don't study the scriptures that much. You know, honestly, I've, I've studied a lot in the scriptures. I haven't given that, devoted that time into the Constitution, and so I always, I always love hearing you, you go on about it. You sometimes you'll have your little rants, and it's just like, it's, it's amazing for me to learn. And like, that's, that's, I don't know. It just, it, it rings, it rings. It's, I think, spark is the right word. And um, the other day when you called me, and you're like, hey, let's do, let's do the, the podcast. You're like, yeah, I think we should do it. I don't know if it was that same day or it was a little bit before the day before the day after but relatively close to then we read um as a family we read alma 60 and that's where captain moroni he writes the letter to pahoran and he's like pahoran you're doing a terrible job we need we need to be supported the armies need to be supported and and the letter is really really like bold and and that's the thing that um that stuck out to me is here's here's moroni's words he says and i will come unto you and if there be any among you that has a desire for freedom, yea, if, the, if there be even a spark of freedom remain, remaining, behold, I will stir it up, I will stir up insurrections among you, even until those who have desires to usurp power and authority shall become extinct. And it's like, 
that that idea of if there's even just the spark of freedom and that's that that spark is i think it's shared by like like a fire like it grows from person to person it grows from that that there's there's a, a i have a brother-in-law who told me a term and it's a german term that i i had never heard before but it's called zeitgeist have you heard that yeah i've heard it i don't remember what it means basically the the concept and i could be misrepresenting it this is how he explained it to me and it made sense but it's the will of the people and it's not necessarily like oh everybody talks about it but there is a general sense and a general attitude that the public has it that a, that a, that, a, that a nation or have that um to motivate them to action that motivates them to action i i think that it's probably just a suspicion but i think that it's probably tied to the light of christ especially when that action is is righteous um and it's and it's it's one of those things that I hope that's that's what I really hope to gain from it is the, the, from the podcast itself is I hope that it gets people to one not live in despair not be like oh doom and gloom the world's falling apart which we all see it is but that doesn't mean that we need to be um, little not I'm trying to not like we we don't want to be babies we don't want to be useless we want to live and and be strong men be strong priesthood holders and be strong for the lord you know you, you listen to the I, we, i've really loved the the church um at home because of blessing the sacrament at home you listen to the words of the, the the of the sacrament prayer and it's really like it's powerful where it says just how you need to be a witness we covenant to be witnesses you know and that's not a hard thing to do it just takes courage and a little bit of courage and and you stand up and it's it's it spreads the willingness to stand up that's that's it, it goes back to like uh <clears throat> after september 11th and they they were pushing the uh the whole if you see something say something uh-huh that applies to this as well um, I mean, we're not. It's been it's been said that if the United States falls, it won't fall from any outside threat. It will fall from the inside, and that's true. We're watching it happen right now with all these riots and all these people tearing shit down and wanting to to change fundamentally change what this nation is, mm-hmm. and we can't allow that. We just can't. That is the scripture that you're reading. I think it's the next one's. You want me to read it? Yeah. It's the one that says the sword will fall upon you. They're talking. He's talking to us, to our generation, to our time. That's what he's talking about. Okay, so that was 27. 28 says, Yea, behold, if I do not fear your power, nor your authority, but it is my God whom I fear, and it is according to his commandments that I do take this, my sword to defend the cause of my country. And it is because of your iniquity that we have suffered so much loss. And then 29 says, Behold, it is time, yea, and the time is now at hand, that except ye do bestir yourselves in the defense of your country and your little ones, the sword of justice doth hang over you, yea, and it shall fall upon you and visit you even to your utter destruction. Yeah. That's, that's, real, that's to us. Yeah. That's to us in our day, in our age, in our generation. If your own personal liberty doesn't stir you enough to action, that of your posterity should. It is on us to pass something down to our posterity that is worth passing down. What I'm seeing is not worth passing down. Mm -hmm. And that's on us to stand up, to rise up, to be vocal, to write our representatives, state, local, federal, and say, look, (coughs) excuse me, we've drifted too far away you have usurped too much power. We have been silent, but we won't anymore. Yeah. And we need to do everything that we can in our power to fix this peacefully and fix it the right way first before you before you resort to force. That's the thing. Is like if 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 we don't do everything we can now, then it's far harder to justify the violence that is going to come. Yeah. And it's like. You don't, you don't, nobody wants that, that has a good, that has desires for good and, and justice and, 
and freedom, nobody wants violence, especially a civil war. No. But well, it's one of those things that if we don't wake up now, it's go it's coming. It's going to come. Yeah. You yeah, know, I did I did two tours to Iraq. My second one wasn't anything special, but my first tour and you know this, I was in Ramadi in two thousand five, two thousand six, right in right in some of the worst fighting of the entire war and it was street fighting and it was close, it was bloody, it was nasty. I I've spilled blood and I've buried my brothers. I don't want another war. I would love nothing more than to just have everything go back to the way it was and all of us collectively work together to turn this nation back into what it is. I don't want to do that here. But if it's going to happen which I think it is, it's inevitable, an inevitability, and we all know that, it's a prophecy. I would much rather that, I, that it's me that has to go than my children. I don't want my children to have to go through that. I don't want them to have to take a life. I don't want them to have to bury their, their um, uh, the other people that they're fighting with, because that's, that is, According to Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, losing one of your one of your comrades in arms that is the second most painful loss that you can that you can endure next to the loss of a child because you do everything together. Yeah, you do everything together with your spouse, and you love your spouse, and it would be hard to lose your spouse. I have not been through that, and I hope that I never do. But with with the people that you serve with you're you're in it with them every single day you're seeing humanity at its worst you're also seeing love at its best and that that really creates just this this bond that I don't really even know how to how to share if you if you know you know if you don't, then you really don't, but I mean, it's just, it's a bond that only people who've been in combat can share, mm -hmm. because you're killing together, you're dying together, and like I said, you see the worst humanity has to offer, but then again, at the same time, you see the absolute best that man has to offer, you see um, love that I, I would assume, and I speculate, that the only love stronger than what you'll see in combat is the Savior's love. Because you've got, you've got guys, and they're willing to sacrifice their life, their tomorrows, to, to save you, to save somebody else, to save somebody they don't even know. And while the reasons why we went to Iraq and Afghanistan may never really be clear to us, most of the guys that I know I know the reason I went over was to help the people over there, to help them gain that sense of liberty for themselves. And so, going off, <laughs> going off topic from where we started, I, it's just, I would much rather it be me that has to fight than my kids, because I know how ugly it is. I know how ugly a civil war here would be, because the, estab the establishment and the media has done a wonderful job of turning the pre-pandemic, everybody hates the government, is starting to turn against them, to really just turning us against each other. Yeah. And we can all see it, but nobody will put the pieces together. And so they turn this into a race war. Not only are we fighting ourselves, but the United Nations is going to get involved, and the Russians and the Chinese, and it's just not going to be good for anybody. One of the things that's and just on a on a individual level, one of the things I noticed my wife pointed out to me today. <coughs> but you look at you go to the store. We went to the store today. We didn't have masks on. Everybody looks at you funny, and you don't have masks on, which is whatever, you know. But you look at the way that people who have masks on act, Take exit three and then they have a. Left two lanes to turn left onto Utah 79 East. There's there's an interesting. Um, protection from rep repercussion it feels like this is, you look and what I'm referring to is like there was somebody wearing a mask pushing their carts you know and there's people who are just leaving their carts roll over 
And it's like, you, you have this kind of stuff before we had the whole mask craziness, but people are, were being belligerently rude to each other. And it's like, because you don't see each other's face, it's like, you can't, you, uh, there's, there's like a, you're, you're, you're covered from the shame. You're, co you're, you're protected from the shame. And it's, it's interesting. There's a, it's a psychological thing, I think, where like you, the, 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 it changes the, so the, the way we interact with each other, covering your face changes that. And it's like... It I'm, makes people submissive. It does. It's a form of submission. It's, you lose your face, you lose your identity, you're easier to control. It's, 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 it's weird. And the thing that I get, one of the things that I get really worried about, and not like, I'm not, I'm not kept up overnight because I know my kids are going to be okay, but all of the kids who are going to have their, their, the way that they think, just the way that your brain operates is going to be a little bit different because of the, the exposure of long time keeping it keeping keeping yourself covered from the public yeah you know who else has done that yes yeah <laughs> are you referring to the muslims yes i am Jihad. actually the the face coverings for women is a sign and a form of submission that's why they do it mm -hmm. that's the in the middle east long before long before muhammad and long before islam that's what they do with their slaves. They cover their faces. It creates a form of submission. That's interesting. I your didn't... face, your face is your identity. I didn't whether know a... whether you're incredibly handsome like me, <laughs> or or you're kind of ugly. I mean, your your face <laughs> is your face is your identity, and that's never going to change. Well, the thing that the thing like that was those uh, I was mentioning that the. I didn't do a very good job articulating it, but basically somebody was really rude and um, with their cart and stuff, and like they just gave a belligerent look today um, at the store, and and it made me think of like you know the Adam and Eve story where Adam he he hides from God, you know, and it's just like that that shame is like you hide, and the the mask. There was a parallel that ran in my mind, and I don't know if it's just anecdotal or whatever, but the the parallel in the mind was we cover our face so that we can do things that are shameful. Yeah, and it's like people who rob banks. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that people who murder. Well, if they're smart, well, <laughs> smart <-ter. laughs> And we also just you, the simple fact that you can't smile at people, you can't. It, it breaks down that that interpersonality. That um, especially in the in the country that we're in, with the, such a diverse demographically con demographic set up or I don't know I, there, there's so many different cultures that come together it's you you want to bridge as many get as many misunderstandings as possible and the facial expressions that we have really help you bridge those misunderstandings yeah but if if we can if we can get the people to fight each other then the government doesn't have anybody stopping the government from taking whatever it wants yeah well you know I was having a conversation with one of the guys I work with earlier this week mm -hmm. and we were talking about the COVID thing and he he's older he's about ready to retire and mm -hmm. he's of that generation you listen to the news the news isn't going to lie mm -hmm. you know and so he's thinking that this whole thing is worse than it really is but when you look at everything objectively with the padded numbers and did you uh, see that the CDC came out just this week and they 94% of the COVID deaths they attributed to, to secondary conditions secondary conditions yeah. yep yep and it's like oh that's well that that information is not new it's been out since well for a long time everybody if you were paying attention anyway yeah well the cdc uh, went and re, re they corrected their own statistics which i thought was interesting usually they don't they're not so open about their own mistakes yeah yeah but yeah and so we were having that conversation and he was talking about um he said the the prophet asked us to wear a mask. And that's one of the reasons why I'm wearing a mask. I said, and he was getting defensive about it. I'm like, look, look, I don't care if you wear a mask. You want to wear a mask? Cool, go for it. Do whatever, man. I don't care. But I shouldn't be forced to wear your fear. Mm -hmm. If I have done my own research and I feel confident in the fact that I don't need to wear a mask, why should I wear a mask? Why should other people be making that choice for me? Well, as a society, we've turned fear into a virtue that's the first time that <laughs> yeah. that's the first time i've seen this happen is like well I'm, I'm 
Don't, not that I know a ton of crap, but well, we, we've the, literally turned fear into a virtue, and it's like I'm more afraid of you, and so I'm more virtuous than you. <laughs> and you should you should be ashamed that you're not as scared as I am. Uh, that's abs- that's absolutely right. You know, there, our society has turned a lot of things that are well cowardly into a virtue. Fear is a virtue, and also for some reason I don't know why you would ever want this, but being a victim is also a virtue somehow. Yeah. Why Why anybody would ever want to be a victim basically saying I'm not in control of my own life and my own destiny is beyond me. I'm not I'm not tough enough to to grow myself or to learn or to All my problems fix my are problems. somebody yeah. else's fault. Yeah. No, nobody else will, no, your problems aren't somebody else's fault. You're you're just a victim of your own stupidity. We all are. <laughs> That's how we learn. Yeah. If you don't make a stupid choice, then you're not going to learn anything. You make a good choice, you learn something. But, I mean, the most powerful lessons that we're going to learn as people is from our mistakes. The more painful the mistake, the stronger the lesson, the more of an impression that makes on us. Mm-hmm. And I, well, I, I, I want to say there's nothing wrong with that, but in our, all reality, <laughs> there is. Everything that you just said... Why don't you say it again? <laughs> like, like uh, how far back are we going? Because I said some naughty stuff. <laughs> okay. I, but, just but I want you to. I want. I want you to say the the three types of men again. Because here's the, here's the thing. I um we uh, I mentioned how like oh, I try not to swear and stuff, and, <clears throat> and you had mentioned like honestly we we want to find people who have the spark of freedom in them already, and then that well, that's what brought you to the three types of men. Yeah, so I was I was just telling Fred there's there's three types of men. You have violent men, and they are just they're just hell bent on sharing their pain and their suffering with other people, and that's just what they are. They're broken. They're not they're not good men. Then you have you have peaceful men, and the peaceful men. In order to be peaceful, you have to be capable of great violence. Otherwise, you're not peaceful. You're just harmless. And so, to be peaceful, you must be capable of violence. Then you have your third type of man is a harmless man. You're not peaceful. You're just harmless. You don't have the... You don't have the fortitude to rise up to violence to defend yourself or somebody else. The needs be... And I was telling, I was about to tell Fred, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not willing to rise up, defend yourself, defend your family, or defend somebody else, why should somebody else be willing to do that for you? You're your own first responder. You're the first person on scene. You're the first person that's going to be there to have to take care of yourself or your family if the need arises and you're going to need a gun if you're an American if you live in another country that sucks and you should move here (laughs) well legally and then you should assimilate assimilate yourself to our culture (laughs) one of the things that um, that really gets me is like it's very easy to think, oh, we're in this, this, there's a lot of great people. There's a lot of good people around us. There's a lot of, and then you have this, this safety net where you don't have to act. You, you always assume that, oh, someone else will take care of it. Someone else will fix the problem. But you look at, I mean, just if you look at, spend any amount of time looking at some of the riots that have been going on for the last three months. Just yesterday, you had people in New York who were sitting at a table, like the, the, the the restaurants they were just out to dinner at restaurants and mobs came and broke the tables and they, they, they were turning over tables while people were sitting there throwing shit all over just. yeah and it's just it was it was one of those things that we all think that oh someone else will take care of it someone else will stand and that's not the way it works you are the cavalry there's there's no other cavalry coming it's you and you have to stand up and you have to first be prepared to like like what you said about the peaceful men a peaceful man is not someone who never does harm. A peaceful man who is capable of harm and chooses to be peaceful. That's where agency really comes in. 
you're not exercising agency if you make yourself incapable of harm. If you make yourself unable to hurt something or someone else to protect those around you. And and the, th- the thought comes to my mind with my kids, like with, with spankings and stuff, you know? A lot of parents are like, oh, you can't, you got to be really, really, uh, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of diverse um, ways of thinking about raising kids. But when I give my kids a spanking, I don't enjoy it. I don't do it out of anger. I never, one thing I remember from my dad, when I would get a spanking as a kid, it was never something that my dad did impulsively it was always put your hands against the wall you're getting a licking you know are are you saying he wasn't laughing maniacally as he whooped your ass no your butt you you know well here's the thing one time i remember we snuck uh we tried using pillows sticking them in our pants and he caught that but i took (laughs) i took my dad's wallets i would take he had a few wallets in his closet and i put one in each of my back pockets (laughs) <laughs> and he didn't notice a few times. I felt bad about it, and so I told him about it. And so I got like two spankings after that, you know. Awesome, <laughs> one for each wallet. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it totally worked. But but I guess coming back to it, when it's like when when I have to when my kids do something wrong and they need to be punished, and it's not like there's if I can fix it verbally and I can tell them and teach them verbally and they can learn a lesson verbally, that's how I choose to do it. Yeah. But when they when they can't learn, especially when they're young, like. For instance, if a kid runs out in the street, you can't you can't be okay with that because the next time he does that, he could be hit by a car. Yeah. They have to have something abrupt that lets them know that is not okay. And yeah. a spanking is like it's not something you enjoy doing, but it just needs to be done. And that's violence is the same thing. It's not something that you you seek out. You don't want to be a hero and go and hurt people. It's you. It's just something that has to be done. And if you can't stand up and do it then you're in that third category of man who is imp- impotent? I don't know if that's the... <laughs> no, that's not the right word. Impotent is not the right word. That's... <laughs> Obviously, I know what impotent means, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have doctors for that if that is your problem. Um, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. People lis- that listen to this will know what you're saying, but... The best, the best fight you can get into is the kind that you can't avoid. But there may come times, hopefully not, but there may come times that your back is up against the wall and your only choice is to either fight or die. And ultimately, you might fight and die, but if you fight and die, at least you're going on your own terms. You're going as a free man. You've made your choice, and that decision was yours. Ultimately, that's a decision that you have to make on your own. Are you willing to stand and fight? Or are you just going to submissively die? I have, ever since I was in the military and I was in Iraq, I've I've committed myself to the thought that if I'm going to go out that way, <laughs> that way, if I'm going to go out in that way, I'm going to take somebody with me. Uh, preferably, I'm going to take as many people with me as I can if there's multiple people. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, then and that also goes back to my experiences and where I've been, what I've done. You know, your your results may vary, yeah. more or less. But, I mean, you really, if you don't already have one, you should get a concealed weapons permit if you can. You should commit yourself to training as often as you can. And there's there's lots of great alternatives so you're not spending as much money on ammo, and especially right now where ammo is pretty scarce. Um, you can get you can get some really realistic airsoft guns. You can practice in your garage, your backyard, whatever. That's one of the things that I do because I'm pretty stingy with my ammo, especially right now when I can't replace it. So I'll train with with airsoft in my backyard and practice my movements my my clearing corners um you know drawing from concealment drawing from a tactical holster stuff like that um but you really you need to get your concealed weapons permit you need to get the training you need to get the knowledge of your platform and you need you need to be prepared to defend your family your family's safety should be enough to motivate you to do those things you know, I can't think of anything worse of needing anything worse than needing to have a gun to protect my family or other innocent people 
and not having one. I've devoted a, my entire adult life to mastering, mastering that as best as I can, and I always push myself. And I will say that I am far, far more proficient in those aspects than I was when I left the military because I continually pushed, I continually trained. I put hundreds of thousands of rounds through rifles, I put hundreds of thousands of rounds through pistols. And Fred and I, we went to, we went to a pistol course. Uh, what was it, a month and a half ago? Yeah, about a month ago, something. Month and a half ago. And while everybody's doing this, you know, some of, some of the people are struggling. There's nothing wrong with that. They're trying to, they're trying to better themselves. They're trying to learn, and that's great. That's absolutely great. But I found myself bored. You found yourself bored. <laughs> I found myself bored while I was doing it because it just I've I've surpassed that. I mean, it's always good to practice the basics. And, you know, the easy stuff. It's always good to do that, but you should continually push yourself to get better and better, just like your spiritual progression. It's one of those things that's like, you, you know, I, I thought of it when, when you look at people and you, you have that natural tendency to compare yourself to others. And you're like, oh, I'm never going to up, match up to so-and-so. And we naturally have a way of comparing our flaws with other strengths. And it's, it's really interesting because it's discouraging if you do that. But when one of the things, that you, if you surround yourself by people and be the type of person who encourages others regardless of where they're at, regardless of what, they, what, what stage they're at, in, in whether it's your, your proficiency with weapons, whether it's your spirituality, whether it's your intelligence, whether it's your, your work ethic, whatever it is, if, if someone's trying and you're encouraging them, and you're around people who do that for you, it's that principle that, that Uchtdorf talked about where you lift where you stand. You, regardless of what position you're in, you make things better for everybody. And when, when you get around people who are just complainers, oops, sorry, it's the exact opposite. It's like, no matter what happens, it's never good enough, or it's never, it's, it's never, oh, it's always, it's, there's always some insurmountable um, obstacle that you can't pass, and it's, that that leads to discouragement and it leads to Satan winning because a lot of I truly believe that this battle that we're facing is a moral battle and a religious a, a religious battle. You look at legislation. So much of our legislation is is written with the idea that you're going to force people to make good choices. You cannot and you cannot legislate morality. Our our country has has lost so many of its moral attitudes, it's moral standings, and because you can't legislate morality, you you have politicians that try and legislate it with alternative motives, with other things, there's there's always there's always things that that take away our freedom and they, that come back to that that battle for agency. And it's 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 why we we have to stand up and, and fight for what's right and and actually make a stand. And I guess the question I have is what what before, before we go to, you know, ultimate worst case scenario where we're in the civil war and you have to actually stand up and physically fight for your family, what can we do now to, to not get there or to avoid that as, as hopefully as to, to turn our culture away from that? That was like we were talking about earlier, right? Con contact your representatives. Let them know where you stand. Encourage your friends, your family to contact their representatives and let them know where we stand. Because the majority of people don't want what's going. The majority of people, I think, want to be more free, want to keep more of their money. I know I do. I literally tear my body apart for my paycheck to better myself and to better my family. And they steal it. No, they don't. I don't willingly give them to it. They steal it under threat of force, also known as extortion. And not only do they extort my money from me, they use my money to pay for things and fund things that I disagree with at a basic fundamental level. I shouldn't be paying for somebody's abortion. I shouldn't be paying for people to live because they're too lazy to work. That's just not right. You can't, just like Fred said, you can't legislate morality, nor should you. You can't legislate charity, nor should you. Uh, 
You'll have to edit that out. Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to stop it? No. Okay. Um, well, yeah, you, you can't legislate those things, and it's not their job to. I am already... I already donate to several groups. I donate, well, I'm not going to say who I donate to or how much, but I think most people do that. You find the causes that you stand behind, and you donate your money. It's not the government's job to force charity on me. And if you are intent on, on taxes, let the people decide where their money is going to go. So that way, I'm not funding the things that I disagree with. We didn't have a federal income tax until, what, was it 1932? Right around the time that they passed the Unconstitutional National Firearms Act. Yeah, there's a whole lot of great things going on in the 30s. And now, with changing subjects, switching gears. That's right, that's right. <laughs> I like where you're going. With that... It goes back to, like I was saying earlier, about the original intent at the time that it was signed and the time the Bill of Rights, specifically in this instance, was ratified. Uh, the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The intent of the Second Amendment is so that the people can form militias and they cannot be outgunned by either our government or a foreign government that would choose to invade. And think of that. Think of the very way that that's worded. I mean, just on a, on the looking at the words themselves, the, the the right to bear arms shall not be infringed is not putting a limit on the people. That's not saying, oh, people have this right or people don't have this right. It's putting a limit on the government. The it's government does not have the right to infringe upon people's rights. It's an explicit statement to them that the the right. I'm going to break it down a little bit further. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That doesn't mean, you know, what we grant is okay. When the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791, there were citizens who owned their own private warships. <laughs> Which, by that theory and the intent when it was written, I should be able to buy an aircraft carrier and park it in the canal if I want to. <laughs> I mean, I probably have to dig my own because, well, I block water and it's not going to fit. But that's here. That's that's neither here nor there. <laughs> the intent is for me to be as well armed and well equipped as the military, and to sit there and listen to people say, "Well, they couldn't have foreseen machine guns and, and this and that." That's just a lazy argument. Of course they did. Technology hadn't stood still up until seven until 1791. Yeah. And we all. We all know that, just as they did then. Technology is going to evolve. I should be able to go to Ace Hardware and buy a machine gun if I want to. I would probably wouldn't because they're expensive. But that's that's just the thing with a lot of those items. They're going to be cost prohibitive anyway. Yeah. But I should not like the fact that I can't just go buy a suppressor or I can't just have a short barreled rifle. Why? The thing that that's really interesting to me is every argument that you'll hear against that concept of oh you, a, should, a citizen shouldn't be able to do that because of an insert whatever argument we want the core of that argument is comes back to the citizen is less moral than the government as yeah. an organization and that's with that assumption falls our, our country falls our whole the 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 whole thing that the Constitution seems to be written on, from the, from the way I can see it, is based off of the individual. Based Absolutely. Based off of the morality of the individual. Absolutely. And no matter what government, regardless of regardless of the government structure, no matter what government we have, if the if the society is wicked, the it will do wicked things. Mm -hmm. even, even if you look at, like, we... Yeah, I know we don't live in a democracy, but it's democracy itself, if the society is wicked, democracy is nothing good. That just means that everybody gets to vote on wicked things. Yeah. And th that's what I'm trying to get at, though, is like, I view one of the core problems that we have is we as individuals are not moral people. And, and yes, there are individuals that are moral people. I guess I guess I said that in a poor way, but we do not hold each other to a moral standard. It's... There, there's been so much of this idea of, oh, it's 
it's my truth, or it's oh, it's my reality, or oh, it's my my virtue, and it's and it's ways to excuse bad behavior. It's ways to excuse. It always comes down to ways to to justify things that are that are unmoral. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, going back to the Constitution being written all based on the individual, it absolutely is, and that was the intent for man to be able to make his own decisions, be able to decide for himself what it was all predicated on. Um, I forgot where I was going. One of the things um, that you said earlier, you talked about how we need to be writing our our politicians, we need to be writing the representatives and let them know what we think and let them know how we feel. How, how, how do you people start that? Because I've, I've thought that and I've I've never really written people much. I've never gotten into that. And it's, I don't like, I don't, I, I, I'd rather not deal with politics. And that's how I think most people are, is they don't want to deal with politics. Well, when we're, when we're speaking about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, we're not talking about politics. We're talking about doctrine. That's been stated. <laughs> that's been stated. The, the prophets have said that. It was either David O. McKay or Ezra Taft Benson that said that. We're not discussing politics, we're discussing doctrine. Now, I'm really going to dri- try and drive that point home for anybody that's listening to this. If only one person gets that drove into their head, that's fine. But uh, that's the way that you have to look at this. We're not, when it comes to the Constitution, we're not talking politics, we're not talking red versus blue. We're, we're talking doctrine. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, is doctrine. It is scripture. I guess what I'm thinking about, though, is how often do you think someone should write? How often do you think someone... What should someone say? What? I know that you've told me about how often you've, you've written to representatives and you've, you've expressed yourself. What do you do? I, I pay attention to what's going on. Um, as, as, as funny as it might sound... I follow a lot of different pages on Facebook, and um, they'll tell me, you know, these are the kind of bills that are being proposed right now, and so I can do a quick Google search on it and find out, oh, hey, yeah, they really are doing this, or, oh, man, this guy was up in the night, I don't know what the hell, uh, what he's talking about, um, and then you just, you can Google who your representatives are if you don't know, you should know. It's your job and your duty to be an informed American. But, I mean, one thing that we ultimately have to look at with this is if freedom fails here, then it's gone. There's not another chance for the world. The United States of America is the last, absolute last chance for freedom. If it's snuffed out here, it's snuffed out the rest of the world, and there's not going to be another chance. And if you're saying, oh, well, we'll just wait for the second coming, well, sorry, that's not going to happen. Because in order for Christ to come to return, he has to have a land and a people to return to. That's how important this is. So, I mean, we can... That's so interesting. And it's so interesting, it's written even there in our in the Articles of Faith where we we believe that the new Jerusalem will be built here when speaking to people who are outside of, of our faith it's like that's a that's something that we don't get pressed on much that's something that we don't like I don't know it doesn't it's not it's not it's not something that I've heard many people push me on and I've talked to quite a few people that are uh, different Christian denominations and stuff like that, and that's that's a uh, actual written into our articles of faith is that we believe that the the New Jerusalem will be Zion. The New Jerusalem will be here in the American continent, here in the United States. Yep. The law will go forth from the west, and this gospel will spread from the east. I believe is what was said in one of those books that I read. <laughs> There's been a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, and that's... 
I mean, ultimately, we know the outcome. We know how this is going to end. So you shouldn't really be fearful of it in the first place. That's one of the things that I think is really... I get... I get so it seems like every time that I've gotten into um, more of the political discussion, not every time, but the oftentimes I listen to... Uh, after listening to, like, radio talk show hosts, you think of, like, Glenn Beck or, like, just people that that you listen to that you leave after after weeks of listening to. It's like, it's almost, like, depressing. It's almost like it leaves you with a, a somber, <laughs> yeah, the world, doom and gloom, everything, you know? Yeah. And I think that, especially with radio and stuff, it's because when you want people to act, you need to evoke emotion yes and one of the easiest emotions to evoke is is negative emotions mm -hmm. whether that's fear or anger both of those are are easier to emoke than evoke than than joy than, yes than true I don't know happiness and, and yeah, you can uh, you can't know happiness and joy if you don't understand despair that's that's very true that's very true that's very clear. I don't know. One of the things that um, I, I really liked, I think you've sent it to me recently. Um, it, it was it in Ether where it talks about how you need to wake up to the wicked, or the, the wretched state in which you are. Yes. If you give me just a second, I can pull it up. I'm not going to read it. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. I do. I actually do. But like I said, I'm kind of driving, so... If it'll pull up. Okay, let's go. I guess one of the things that comes to my mind though is like, how how do you get people to how do you get people to really wake up and to be to realize how important the the fight for freedom and the fight for for virtue and for God is in your day-to-day -day lives and not just be pessimistic or, you know, a downer. Well, we, you know, people say I don't want to focus on the bad. And, you know, I get it. I understand. We shouldn't be always focusing on the bad. That's not healthy. But you kind of have to at the same time. Don't let it rule your life but let it help prepare you for the things that are inevitably to come. <laughs> Do you want me to read your comment above this or just the scripture? You can read my comment above it if you'd like, or you can read just the scripture. I don't care. Okay, here's what you say. You say, I don't post scripture or prophecy or religious posts. It's just not what I do. My personal beliefs and my testimony of the gospel are just that, mine. However, I feel compelled to share this scripture things are becoming more and more apparent and we all need to look around and pay attention to what is going on around us and this is ether 12 ether 8 24 and 25 it says wherefore the lord commandeth you when ye shall see these things come unto come among you that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation because of the secret combinations which shall be among you or woe be unto you because of the blood of them who have been slain for the for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it and also upon those who built it up for it cometh for it cometh to pass that whoso whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overflow overthrow the freedom of all lands nations and countries and it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people for it is built by the devil who is the father of all lies even that same liar who beguiled our first parents yea even that same liar who hath caused man to commit murder from the beginning who hath hardened the hearts of men that they have murdered the prophets and stoned them and cast them out from the beginning. Yeah. So the main takeaway from that, 
and the scriptures that we read earlier, especially was a verse 29 from Alma 60. The sword, the sword shall fall upon you. Well, if you just sit back and allow these things to happen, it's not going to be good for you. I not here uh, in the mortal existence, and it won't be good for you in the spiritual existence either for eternity. I really like that, for the part of that that says you need to awake to the awful situation in which you are. Yes. It's like when, and he's talking about the secret combinations. When they come mm-hmm. among you, you need to wake up. Antifa? <laughs> I think that... that Black so, Lives Matter? Here's, here's the thing that came to my mind. And this is this happened to me maybe three years ago, where I mean everybody can see. I mean if you're American, you can see there's problems. We run into political we run into political disagreements when we try and solve the problems. You know, oh we should do this, we should do that, blah blah blah. Well, the thing that came to my mind there was I think it was about three years ago, maybe two years ago, I don't remember. But a comedian that I really like, his his name's Owen Benjamin. He's he's a guy that. He was in um, in Hollywood. He was he was a pretty popular comedian. He um, was basically kicked out of Hollywood and ostracized because there was a there was an agent, a, a big agent that was talking about his his kid, and he was saying how his kid's a trans kid, and he's he's and he doesn't have a, a daughter. It's a son or something like that. He doesn't have a son. It's a daughter. One of the things. Now the kid is like three years old or something like that. And, and Owen Benjamin's like, no, that's child abuse, and you're a bad person for, for saying that your child is a trans kid. And you're gonna, he, the guy, the guy was the the agent guy. He was looking for um, for praise from the social group that because he's gonna put his kid on hormone blockers and stuff like that. And and Owen's like, no, you're that's child abuse. You're a bad person. And. Owen's agent contacts him. Hey, you gotta apologize for this stuff. You, these are these are powerful people, and you can't be talking to them like that. He's like, no, I'm not gonna apologize for that. That's wrong. And and he he took a stand, and he basically was like, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play this game of oh, I gotta be nice to the right people who are evil people. Yeah. And he was kicked out of Hollywood, and, and I and I I really I really respect him for that because he had he had literally thousands, tens of thousands of dollar deals that were washed up overnight that were like his his income was just cut and he went back to his home in New York and became an arborist with his brother you know and um and then he, do, he does live streaming and stuff like that but um so he's he's doing fine but the thing that really he, he one of the things one of his, his streams he was talking about all of the, the the pedophilia and the wicked undertones in Hollywood. He gets into Jimmy Savile. He gets into some, like Epstein, and this is years before Epstein was um, was even suicided. <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is uh, I, as I said two or three years ago. I don't remember exactly when. I don't know. It was it was it was one of those one of those um, times where I remember hearing this stuff. And you hear this stuff and you think, okay, that's crazy. Like, there are not really people like this. There are not really people like this. Like, it's, it's, that's too far out there that you just, you literally don't, it's, it's a traumatic experience to believe that there's that kind of wickedness in the world. And that, that same, that same week, I was reading Sun Tzu. And Sun Tzu, he goes in and talks about sex magic. He talks about how, um, and this is Sun Tzu. He talks about how in the, um, in ancient Egyptian culture, or not in, in ancient Chinese culture, there was a, a belief, and it was called sex magic, where you take the innocence and you, and, and it's you take the um, take children, you take women that are that are um, virgins, you take and 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 forcefully force yourself on them, and you take that innocence into you, and it makes you stronger. And this is in Sun Tzu, and and it, you know certainly have to obviously you know Sun Tzu, as I'm guessing. Right? I do. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, on the same that, that same week, I, I read that, and it was like, oh, that's weird. You know, you hear something in one place, you hear something from another place, and it's like, okay, that's that's really weird. And then the same place, that same week, I read an ether where it talks about the secret combinations and the 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 oaths and the pacts that they make with each other, and and it talks about, and it was very clear to me that there was there was that deviance in there, and it talks about how these secret combinations are brought from the father of lies from Satan 
and they are found among all nations, among all peoples. And and it was just like it was okay. I you know you see something in one place, you see something in another place, and the, and you feel like the okay like okay Lord, am I supposed to be paying attention? And then you read it in the scriptures, and it's like it hit you. It hit me powerfully, and it was one of those wake up moments where it was like, what the crap are we getting into? What the crap is, is going on in our society? And it really, it really made me, it was, it was a wake up to the awful state in which you are. And, and that was a moment that I had where it was like, it was, it was jaw dropping for me to realize not only is, not only is the things that you don't even want to imagine are possible are happening, but they're happening in the, the elite. They're happening in the... The highest the, levels of our society. The, the highest levels of our society. The people that are being praised. You look at like, you look at things like the... Here's one that comes to mind. Ariana Grande. She's a pop star. Nobody really thinks much about her. She put up an uh, upside down Christmas tree last year on Instagram or something like that. I didn't know this, but I, that's supposedly... There's, the, there's, there's some deep satanic meetings that are, that it's basically calling to each other. It's calling to, it's speaking in code. You look at like, there's so many things that people are, are praised for in, in the media. People are like, oh, they're, they're wonderful people in the media. And it's like, no, why would you believe the media? Why would you believe these, these people who want the worst for you? They want to subvert and destroy your culture. They want to subvert and destroy your, your very lives. And it's just, it was, it was a wake-up moment for me that really, it, it helped me to, to realize, okay, you've got to stand up and you've got to grow. That's, I, I don't, you, you've been hassling me for years to get a rifle, to get a, to gun, to get a, you know, to be able to learn to protect myself and stuff. And I've always been, I've always been like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I just, I haven't done it yet. And it was, it was the wake-up time where I was like, okay, when are you going to do it? And yeah. I, I am, you know? Well, it comes down to there finally has to be a point that motivates you enough, something that scares you enough to that point. And until you hit that moment, you're just going to procrastinate it. If you don't make things like that a priority, you never will. It'll never be a priority unless you make it a priority. And it's, it goes back... I'm going to go back to when I said that the best fight that you can be in is the one that you can avoid. You might spend your entire life and you might spend thousands of dollars in ammunition and training. If you never use it, great. That's that's the desired outcome. But you never want to find yourself in a position where you need to know these things and you don't know it. Because unless you are extremely lucky through you know, divine providence, you're probably going to die. So, I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of people like to say, the Lord will take care of it. The Lord will take care of me. Well, that's kind of a two-way street. Mm -hmm. The Lord will take care of you if you've done everything in your power to take care of yourself, to prepare yourself. That's when he steps in and makes up the difference. It's just like with our salvation. Yeah. We're never asked to be perfect. Never once does it say you have to be perfect. I'm far from perfect. I have a whole host of issues. But, we know. We know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't know that. Well, some of them mine is. It, anyway. Oh man. But the, all that's asked of us is to do the best that you can. Try your hardest. Try your hardest. And Christ will make up the difference. That was the whole point of the atonement. Hmm. Do the best that you can do. And I will make up the rest. And for some people, it to from the outside, it may not seem like they're doing a whole lot. But each one of us is different. Each one of us is different. So what may not look like a whole ton of effort from you could be everything and then some that that person has to give. We shouldn't judge them. As long as somebody is trying to better themselves, we need to push that. We need to help them. And that's... I honestly think that the best chance at salvation is not how often we went to church, not how much tithing we paid. I think our best chance at salvation, when it comes down to it, when it comes down to that day of judgment, 
How much did you do to help your fellow man? How much did you do? Christ gave everything he had. He bled out of every pore for us because he loved us. Isn't that about the most perfect example? And I don't know, it should be the hardest the hardest hitting lesson that we can learn through all the all of doctrine and all of the lessons that we've ever learned. Try your hardest and do as much as you can for your fellow man. Am I right? That's the thing that I, I it always has hit me. I don't remember what story it is. There's a story of a guy and I it was probably some general authority telling it or something. I don't remember. But the story basically goes like this, where a man, he, he goes up and has a fireside, and he asks the people around him, he says, what, like the, the, the people at the fireside, he says, what's the clearest indication of your conversion to Christ? And the, for like 30 minutes, people would say things, and they were all, they, they, they would be like, oh, it's, uh, it's your faith, and oh, it's this, and, and, and they were all appropriate, they were all nice things. And he's, he like would write him down on, a, on the chalkboard. And, and he'd write him down, he'd write him down, and he'd be like, thank you. And he'd write him down, and he'd be like, thank you. And then after some, un, I don't know, some amount of time, he, he stopped. And he's like, he took everything on the chalkboard and he erased it. And he said, those, those were all appropriate and those were all very insightful and well thought out answers. But let me teach you this. The single most clear indication of someone's conversion to Christ is the way they treat, the, they treat their fellow man. And that's always, that's always hit me as like, really, when it comes down to it, that's, that is our conversion to Christ is what it's based around, is how we, we treat each other. And that's one of the things that's so interesting to me about like, we, we all seek for charity. We all seek for, for being good and doing good things. And that would seem at odds with Oh, fighting for what's right. That would seem at odds. Like, oh, that doesn't sound... We all want to be nice. And that doesn't, that doesn't sound like that's nice, you know? When, when, when fighting for... How can, you, how can you fight? Because that's not... That's, that's conflict. And the, that's, that's one of the lies of, of the devil, in my opinion. The gospel is not based around nice. Nice, if you look it up in the thesaurus, nice is not a synonym for kind kind is what Christ was kind is there's there's in the definition of kind there's not a anything that indicates that it's avoiding conflict it's always trying to better someone else trying to improve trying to there, there's um, there's there's a there's a tone in that that's trying to put people in a place that's better for them and when you think of a kid that's how you treat kids is like you want to be kind to your kids if they're if they're misbehaving you need to put them in line and that's kind when christ when he whipped the people in the temple he took the time to braid the whip and he told them get out and then he didn't just go in a rage and 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 pout he he whipped them because that is what they needed for their salvation but not only that that's what the people that were came to the temple to worship needed because they came to his father's house that when Christ, we, we always teach about the lamb. Christ was both the lamb and the lion. He was both the lamb and the lion. Meaning, he had, people don't often quote it, but Christ said, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and go buy a sword. Mm -hmm. When Christ was asked, how many swords do I need? He said, two will do. <laughs> you know, these are, these are things that Christ was also the lion. He was, he was... That's, that's why the Israelites thought he was going to come in power and, and destroy the Romans. Because he, he was both. He came as the lamb and he taught, raising from the, the law of Moses, raising it to the law, taking, taking an eye for an eye and enlightening it to be turn the other cheek. But we can't have turn the other cheek without understanding an eye for an eye. Yeah. Um... If you look at it, nice is a description. Nice is a description, while well, kindness is an action. Action. And you can be one but not the other. I'm not particularly a nice person. No. No, I'm not very nice at all. <laughs> I think I'm probably not particularly very kind either, but I try. 
I um, disagree with that, honestly. Oh, do you? Let's not get mushy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not. <laughs> but that, that's just the thing. I mean, you can be kind of an asshole, but still be kind. Are you trying to better somebody? Because my, my wife gets mad at me all the time because I'll say, look at this. Look at this stupid ass. Or something like this. What the? What is this person doing? She's like, why are you being mean? I'm like, well, you know, I, I think a lot of stupidity is perpetuated on the fact that nobody's ever told that they're stupid. <laughs> she says, well, how would you feel if somebody told you you were stupid? Well, honestly, if somebody told me I was being stupid, and when they do at work, <laughs> I take a step back and I look at it, and I ask myself, was I being stupid? And the answer is generally yes. <laughs> I was being stupid. And so I have to shift gears and say, okay, how do I fix this? And so, yes, calling me stupid and calling other people stupid is mean. But if you step back and look at it and try to figure out how to correct the situation, what they did for you is a kindness. One one thing that um, just was you saying that made me think of there's a story that Truman G. Madsen talks about with Joseph Smith where he was asked what do you do when someone is backbiting and they and you hear rumors that someone's been saying mean things about you and Joseph his response was something to the effect and I don't remember word for word but he basically said something to the effect is first I listen and then I try and ask myself okay where would they get this idea from and then he said something to the effect of like most of the time there's some form of truth in what they're saying and there's something I can learn from it. Yeah. Sometimes people are just belligerently mean and that's just the way they are. It's like with violent, with the violent man, they want somebody else to feel their pain. Yeah. But that's not always the case. You ready to fix my car for me? Fix your car for you. No. Nope. you're awesome. It won't turn. It's got the key on, the key light on still. Stupid. I see a little silhouette of a man. You're gay, you are gay, you are really, really gay. <laughs> okay, okay. So, recap. Tonight, day one, the podcast, the greatest show in the world. I don't know, whatever. Um, Elders Rising. We fixed, well... Somewhat. Tried to fix that van. <laughs> the and fix was successful. Yeah, it, we got the part We got the part put in, replaced. And taken back out. And, yeah. A couple times. <laughs> <laughs> tried to tried to make the, the new key work. And, well, I'll be damned if they don't ha- have to be programmed. <laughs> yeah. Technology. It doesn't matter what you switch around on it. Mm-hmm. But, um... I'll put together what we we talked about in the car, um, in the truck when we were on the road. So we we just talked about our thoughts when we were headed down to get the part and stuff. But wrapping it up, what else do you want to bring up? Uh, I don't know. I can. Do you want me to do? Do you want me to read George Washington's vision yes. for America? Yeah, because you do. You have your phone on you. I do. Yes in my pocket I, I like how like you've got this darkness like, shrouding me yeah until I come into the light it's almost like ominous <laughs> I was I was like, pointing and they like, they don't have a clue what I was like, pointing at. like my existence <laughs> <laughs> good thing so what time did we start trying to monkey with that car I don't know 7 8 o'clock it's like one uh, o'clock now don't know. It's like two o'clock. You you called me at about seven ish. Said I can't garbage. get. And then we had our amazing road trip to Ogden. Mm-hmm. Um. So I've got Washington's vision right there, and I want to try and find. Um, I think it was Orson Hyde. Talked about it before. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, there was this, the uh, 
there was a Revolutionary War veteran who was recounting the story of George Washington's vision that he had in in Valley Forge after the famous prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, oh yeah. Um, so this says Moroni is the angel of America. This is by Orson Hyde. This is four years before um, this this gentleman recounts the story of Washington's vision. Um, and it, for me, it, you know, is saying that this really did happen because everything becomes speculated to history and, you know, there's so many legends and stuff like there and people try to disprove and discredit things that did happen saying that's not possible. You know, mm-hmm. um, anyway, Orson, Orson Hyde said in those early and perilous times, our men were few and our resources limited. Poverty was among the most potent enemies we had to encounter, yet our arms were successful. And it may not be amiss to ask here by whose power victory so often perched on our banner. It was by the agency of that same angel of God that appeared unto Joseph Smith and revealed to him the history of the early inhabitants of this country, whose mounds, bones, and remains of towns, cities, and fortifications speak from the dust of the years of the living with the voice of undeniable truth. The same angel presides over the destinies of America and feels a lively interest in all our doings. He was in camp in the camp of Washington and by an invisible hand led on our fathers to conquest and victory. And all this to open and prepare a way for the church and kingdom of God to be established on the western hemisphere. For the redemption of Israel and the salvation of the world. This same angel was with Columbus and gave him deep impressions by dreams and by visions respecting this new world, trammeled by poverty and by an unpopular cause, yet this preserving and unyielding heart would not allow an obstacle in his way too great for him to overcome. And the angel of God helped him, was with him on the stormy deep, calmed the troubled elements, and guided his frail vessel to the desired haven. Under the guardianship of this same angel, or Prince of America, has the United States grown, increased, and flourished like the sturdy oak by the rivers of water. The main takeaway from that is Moroni being in the camp of Washington, speaking of, I would assume in this instance, specifically Valley Forge, where the prayer take, took place and where the, his vision he had that vision. I'll go out on a limb and say that um, I, I, I firmly believe that Washington was a national covenant maker. Um, and by definition, a prophet. Not a prophet of the restoration, but um, the definition according to Merriam-Webster for a prophet, is somebody who goes about doing the will and the work of the Lord. Finding America and building this nation was his will and his work. Yeah, that's very clear. Um, so, I'll read Washington's vision. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm getting congested. I hate digestion. Um, and in this in this article, this comes straight from uh, Historic Valley Forge website. Um, it's talking in the National Tribune, 1880. An article appeared giving an account of the vision of Washington at Valley Forge. The account was told by a gentleman gentleman named Anthony Sherman, who supposedly was at Valley Forge during the winter of 77 to 78. The story has been published several times. Some people say that it is substantiated by the fact that a copy of the account is in the Library of Congress. This argument of authenticity is misleading in and of itself. The Library of Congress has copies of anything published. That does not indicate accuracy of the content. I am unaware of any 18th century evidence to corroborate 
that corroborates this story. The soldier mentioned as having a first-hand account of the vision, Anthony Sherman, was a soldier in the Continental Army. However, according to his personal app his pension application written by him, he states that he was at Saratoga under the command of Benedict Arnold at the end of 1777 and only joined the main forces in 1778 in New Jersey just before the Battle of Monmouth. Um, one important thing to note was um, when Anthony Sherman gave his account of the vision, um, he was damn near 100 years old because he gave his account in, what do you say, 1860? Uh, I don't remember. Anyway, so try your own conclusions, but I think about Orson Hyde, and you can look up more things about you know, about it. Um, Anthony Sherman wrote, You doubtless heard the story of Washington going to the thicket to pray in secret for aid and comfort from God. The interposition of, the, of whose divine providence brought us safely through the darkest days of tribulation. One day, I remember it well, when the chilly winds whistled through the leafless trees, Though the sky was cloudless and the sun shone brightly, he remained in his quarters nearly, nearly all the afternoon alone. When he came out, I noticed that his face was a shade paler than usual. There seemed to be something on his mind of more than ordinary importance. Returning just after dusk, he dispatched an orderly to the quarters who was presently in attendance. After a preliminary conversation of about an hour, Washington, gazing upon his companion with that strange look of dignity which he alone commanded, related the event that occurred that day. George Washington's vision. This afternoon, as I was sitting at this table, engaged in preparing a dispatch, something seemed to disturb me. Looking up, I beheld, standing opposite me, a singularly beautiful female, so astonished was I, for I had given strict orders not to be disturbed, that it was some moments before I found language to inquire the cause of her presence. A second time, a third time, and even a fourth time did I repeat my question, but received no answer from my mysterious visitor except a slight raising of her eyes. By this time I felt strange, sensa strange sensations spreading through me. I would have risen, but the riveted gaze of the being before me rendered volition impossible. I essayed once more to address her, but my tongue had become useless, as though it had become paralyzed. A new influence, mysterious, potent, irresistible, took possession of me. All I could do was to gaze steadily, vacantly, at my unknown visitor. Gradually, the surrounding atmosphere seemed as if it had become filled with sensations and luminous. Everything about me seemed to rare, rarefy the mysterious visitor herself becoming more airy and yet more distinct to my sight than before, I now began to feel as one dying, or rather to experience the sensations which I have sometimes imagined accompany dissolution. I did not think, I did not reason, I did not move. All were alike impossible. I was only conscious of gazing fixedly, vacantly, at my companion. Presently I heard a voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. While well, at the same time my visitor extended her arm eastwardly, I now beheld a heavy white vapor at some distance rising fold upon fold. This gradually dissipated, and I looked upon a stranger scene. Before, my lay, before me lay spread out in one vast plain all the countries of the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. I saw rolling and tossing between Europe and America the billows of the Atlantic, and between Asia and America lay the Pacific. Son of the Republic, said the same mysterious voice as before, look and learn. At that moment I beheld a dark, shadowy being like an angel standing in, standing or rather floating in midair between Europe and America. Dipping water out of the ocean in the hollow of each hand, he sprinkled some upon America with his right hand, while with his left hand he cast some on Europe. Immediately a cloud raised from the countries and joined in mid-ocean. For a while it remained stationary and then moved slowly westward until it enveloped America in its murky folds. Sharp flashes of lightning gleamed through it at 
intervals, and I heard the smothered groans and cries of the American people. A second time, the angel dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it out as before. The dark cloud was then drawn back to the ocean, in whose heaving billows it sank from view. A third time, I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. I cast my eyes upon America and beheld villages and towns and cities springing up one after another until the whole land from the Atlantic to the Pacific was dotted with them. Again I heard the mysterious voice say, Son of the Republic, the end of the century cometh, look and learn. At this, dark sh at this the dark shadowy angel turned his face southward, and from Africa I saw an ill-omened specter approach our land. It flitted slowly over every town and city of the latter. The inhabitants presently set themselves in battle array against each other. As I continued looking, I saw a bright angel on whose brow rested a crown of light on which was traced the word Union, bearing the American flag which he placed between the divided nation and said, Remember, ye are brethren. Instantly the inhabitants casting from their, them their weapons became friends once more, and united around the national standard. And again I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. At this the dark shadowy angel placed a trumpet to his mouth and blew three distinct, three distinct blasts, and taking water from the ocean he sprinkled it upon Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. From each of these countries arose thick black clouds that were soon joined into one. Throughout this mass there gleamed a dark red light by which I saw hordes of armed men who, moving with the cloud, marched by land and sailed by sea to America. Our country was enveloped in this volume of cloud, and I saw these vast armies devastate the whole country and burn the villages, towns, and cities that I had beheld springing up. As my ears listened to the thundering of the cannon, clashing of the sword, and the shouts and cries of millions in mortal combat, I heard again the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. When the voice ceased, the dark shadowy angel placed his trumpet once more to his mouth and blew a long and fearful blast. Instantly a light as of a thousand suns shone down from above me and pierced and broke into fragments. The dark cloud which enveloped America at the same moment the angel upon whose head still shone the word Union and who bore a national flag in one hand and a sword in the other, descended from the heavens, attended by legions of white spirits. These immediately joined the inhabitants of America, who I perceived were will nigh overcome, but who immediately, taking courage again, closed up their broken ranks and renewed the battle. Again, amid the fearful noise of the conflict, I heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. As the voice ceased, the shadowy angel, for the last time, dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it upon America. Instantly the dark cloud rolled back together with the armies it had brought, leaving the inhabitants of the land victorious. Then once more I beheld the villages, towns, and cities springing up where I had seen them before. While the bright angel, planning the azure standard he had brought in the midst of them, cried with a loud voice, While the stars remain and the heavens send down dew upon the earth, so long shall the union last. And taking from his brow the crown on which blazoned the word union, he placed it upon the standard, while the people kneeling down said Amen. The scene instantly began to fade and dissolve, and I at last saw nothing but the rising, curling vapor I at first beheld. This also disappearing, I found myself once more gazing upon the mysterious visitor, who in the same voice I had heard before said, Son of the Republic, what you have seen is thus interpreted. Three great perils will come upon the Republic. The most fearful is the third, but in this greatest conflict the whole world united shall not prevail against her. Let every child of the Republic learn to live for his God, his land, and the Union. With these words the vision vanished, and I started from my seat and felt I had seen a vision wherein had been showed to me the birth, progress, and destiny of the United States. And that's the story of Washington's vision for America. 
um, of particular importance is what she, to me, is what she, was what the angel said to Washington at the end. Son of the Republic, what you have seen is thus interpreted. Three great perils will come upon the Republic. The most fearful is the third. But in this greatest conflict, the whole world united shall not prevail against her. And this is a part that I think that we should all really listen to and take to heart and contemplate and consider. Um, let every child of the Republic learn to live for his God, his land, and the Union. That's what we need to do. This has been entrusted to us. And we have our instructions. Not only from from uh, the angel to Washington, but from the church, from the scriptures, from God. We have been given the greatest gift man has ever known. And it's up to us to keep it and to fight for it and preserve sh- it. Preserve it. And that's that really, that really comes back to the, the I don't know it, it reiterates in my mind, the fact that this is a moral battle. We need to turn back to God. We as a nation have have abandoned our faith in Him, and that's one of the. Hey. That'll do. What'd you do? I don't know what I did. That's awesome. It's not my car. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> but um. That's 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 one of those things that I really I, I I hope that that the urgency finds at least someone at least someone that they can that spark of hey first off you can do it like you can you can do something that makes yourself better and turn to God I loved um, was it President Oaks that spoke in the uh, Christmas devotional just last year and he said that the way that we bring peace on earth is to bring peace in our homes bring peace at uh, where we're at and do something that brings that peace and that peace like you pointed out is not um, the inability to have conflict the inability to fight but that peace is the choice to be peaceful amidst the ability to be violent yeah Hope you're ready. We're going to be talking about George Washington a lot and his importance. Um, there was something else that I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but we we'll we plan on talking about the Constitution. We talk, plan on talking about the founders and their importance and their. Um, their being here when they were supposed to be here and needed to be here. I'm just pushing buttons now. I'm sorry. Buttons are cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, this this is important. This is things that specifically we as elders need to be aware of, need to be studying, need to be at least taking into some kind of consideration. We'll read from the Constitution. I plan to probably go through the whole thing, break it down to what it meant, not just, you know, what the words are, but what the original intent was when it was written. Um, we'll read the declaration we'll we'll read the Declaration of Independence. Um, and that should be self explanatory, at least I would think so. Um and then the next one that we do, I'll also read the Speech of the Unknown, which is supposedly the speech that Moroni gave to um, the Continental Congress to get them to all sign the declaration. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the last things that I want to read is from Ezra Taft Benson and he said I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as as prophesied by Joseph Smith it will be saved by the righteous citizens of this nation who love and cherish freedom 
It will be saved by enlightened members of this church, among the others, men and women who understand and abide the principles of the Constitution. I testify that the God of Heaven sent some of His choicest spirits to lay the foundation of this government, and He has now sent other choice spirits to help preserve it. So, you know, I I really, I'm excited. I'm excited. It's one of those things that we need everybody that can see anything is sees that there's 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 darkness in the world and there's light as well um people are doing things there are people that are that are building that are helping people grow that are helping those around them constantly but you don't get that from the media you don't get it from the if you spend too much time on twitter on facebook on anything it's you're going it it sucks the 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 spirit out of you in that sense and so do in real life do something that helps someone else gain that spark that that desire to pr defend and, and protect freedom and that's that's what we hope for yeah um i'll probably set up a a facebook page until facebook takes it down it will in the great purge <laughs> um for a way for people to get in contact with us ask questions and um hopefully bring up some things that we can look up and talk about and consider but um we all need to find that love of freedom we all need to find that um that willingness to defend it but the other thing that we have to remember is Sorry, buttons, buttons. Did you see all these buttons? I saw. This car is full of buttons and bugs now. My parents are going to not be happy. My mom's going to kill me. My mom. But the, the, important, <laughs> the, okay. the, the important thing to remember is that we can't do these things alone. We have to be organized. We have to belong to, to groups that when the time comes we can preserve and defend. That's a big mosquito. Um, so I would suggest seeking out groups that match your, uh, your, your moral compass. Um, there's a lot of different groups out there and it takes a long time to sift through them and find the ones that align with your morals. I know it took me a long time before I found a couple of groups that I could belong to and really feel comfortable in. Um, I think that's one of the one of the innate problems with the people that I mean you think ideologically on the left it's very there's a lot of authoritarian you do what you're told and everything's lockstep you status quo um on the right you have a lot of people who are very independent thinking and they don't want to be tied to and they don't want to be tied down they don't and and it it diminishes unity and so that's that's one of those things that it's part of the nature of the way that you think about things but we, we've got to get over that we have to you have to agree this is what's right and this is freedom if you if you stand for freedom and if you're going to fight for freedom then that's good i'll stand with you moroni when he turned his army on zarahemla it was it was very binary it was very either you stand with us and you support our cause and you support the standard of liberty or we kill you and that's that's about as cut and dry as as you can be but if you don't have that if you don't have that inner purification if you as a people he was an individual first as, as as elder oak said if you don't have that inner um peace in your home in your family in your in your friend group in your life then it's going to be difficult to find it elsewhere but we have to come together and, and find it together. 
that's Absolutely. that's part of the 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 task at hand absolutely i mean even our even our forefathers when um either we hang together or we what what you know the quote better than i do we stand we, we either we hang to get either we stand together or we all hang individually oh i want to say it was john adams or i don't I, i'm this is where you're much better at history than i am oh what is the exact saying hold on i'll f- I thought you know everything. I'll find ev- it, Fred. everything I, that I don't know. I I'm just really tired, assume, Fred. I assume that you know. <laughs> just, 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 just. Okay. Okay. It was Benjamin Franklin, and this was right after they signed the Declaration of Independence. He said, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. That's the way it is. The, uh, on the Declaration of Independence, the signer said, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, and they meant it. That was literally what was on the line. And that's what we need to be willing to do. We have to be willing to sacrifice everything to make sure that the Republic stands, that the Constitution remains, and that's just, that's our calling, that's our responsibility, and I think that's been lost. And it's not just for us, it's not just for the shiny things and the nice having peace, but it's for our kids, it's for it's for the the very lives because if we don't if we don't fight for the society that is going to allow our kids to to raise and grow to maturity allow our grandkids to to grow to maturity unmolested then there's there's then we we won't have that we won't have it no need to like i said earlier tonight it's not just about if your if your own personal freedom and liberty doesn't motivate you enough to action, your posterity should. Countless, countless millions have laid it all on the line to ensure that we had it. We owe it to them, but more importantly, we owe it to our posterity to pass down something worth passing down. Some people might think that that Christ is coming in our lifetime. Maybe. Maybe not. We know that we know that there's going to be some really big issues here. We know that our society has to fall, the Constitution has to hang by a thread, and it has to be saved. And it will be. And it will be dark and it will be ugly. But we know the outcome. We know that we win. We know that light truth and justice prevail it's um, just like in the Old Testament story I can't remember who it was um, but uh, the, the servant boy was worried because of the army outside of the city mm-hmm. and and he's like do you not see who's among yeah, us yeah those that be with us be greater than they that be with them that's the truth. It constantly remind it constantly makes me think of like you think of like the walls of Jericho and they the walls came tumbling down. You think of these these stories in the Old Testament where God literally takes three hundred men and destroys armies, and it's you think of Christianity, the Christianity that we have today, even outside of just the restored gospel, it started from twelve men. The apostles. All it took was 12. All it took was 12. With God, anything can happen. And that's that's why it's like, oh, we get, we get doom and gloom. We get sad and stuff. And it's like, don't. Don't let it get to you. Realize that we're on God's side. It doesn't Nothing else matters. God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power. What else do you need? What else do you want? 
you may feel like you're standing all alone and physically and you know mortally possibly you may find yourself in that position but you're never truly alone that's been stated I don't know how many times throughout the history of the church and through the scriptures you're never alone and, and you can do the impossible the, well you can't but <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that's so interesting to me though is also like you think of the bravery that we need today it's it's taking words currently in the current situation if you live in some of the bigger cities where the riots are happening it's more than that but when in these places here in towns that don't have these major riots that don't have the the infestation yet it will come but the courage that you need now is simply the courage to send a letter to your maybe your sheriff maybe your uh, city councilman or your mayor and say that's wrong and you should you need to represent our views in saying it's wrong that's wrong all it takes is just to say it that's wrong yeah. don't conform don't be don't be um scared of the social shame it's it's just an illusion of power that is standing against us at this point unless you're in one of the the places where they actually are burning burning stuff down it's just the illusion of power that that you're fighting and that's just an illusion. It's just the, the ideas. It just takes a few people to stand up and those people who hear good react and they're like, oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. It's like, why are you wearing a mask? Oh, that's okay. I, I, I'm not political. Why, why, aren't you, why aren't you doing this? Oh, my, I just want to smile at people. Oh, I just, you know, just, just stand up and, and don't conform to everything that's being told to you because the more you conform the more you're prepared to conform when it's, oh, they're taking that family? Oh, yeah, they didn't want to, they didn't want to, whatever the, whatever the excuse is. Yeah. Be sure the, be sure that when you write your representatives or call into their office, remind them the, of the balance of power. Not politically speaking, but on the general scope of things. They're not leaders. They're not officials. They are elected representatives. They are hired to represent you. You are their employer. They work for you. Remind them of that. They hate it, for one. <laughs> they hate it, for one. And two, remind them that your rights are, you know, they're non-negotiable. They're laid out as they are for a reason. They're not. They're not up for for debate they're not up for granted i got a i got a uh email response from one of my senators one day specifically speaking about the second amendment he says um long-held traditions and and being rights don't mean that we can't have a conversation about it yeah it does the debate was settled in 1791. Yeah. You know, it's set in stone. Or you're going to force a whole lot of people to do a lot of things that they don't want to do. They need to be reminded of who truly holds the power. But as long as they keep people comfortable, nobody will do anything. You should be outraged about what they've taken from you and what they've taken from your children. You think it's bad now. The political ram well, the yes, the political ramifications typically take about two generations to really be felt. We're feeling the repercussions of our grandparents' decisions and in inaction. Government doesn't know best. They won't do what's best for you if you think at any point that they give two dams about you, I don't know what to tell you. When it comes to health care, when it comes to this pandemic hoax, if they don't care about their veterans, if they don't care to take care of our nation's veterans who they promised to take care of, who earned it, and deserve it more than anybody, they sure don't give two shits about you. 
and they never will. They care enough to get your vote. So, my advice, my opinion, is to never vote for the same person more than twice. Because after that, they become corrupted and they get comfortable. And people will sit there and they'll whine and complain about the situation and the way that things are going, but they're not smart enough to not vote for different people. It's it's interesting that you say that never vote for the same piece of people more than twice, just because of the saying, a roll, rolling rivers can how long can impure rotters remain? The, one of my uh, one of my bosses he he loves this quote and it's and I'm I'm, I'm butchering it but basically it's like um, how long can rolling waters remain impure? I think that's the quote. But basically it's as long as there's a churn, as long as there's the water continuing to roll. It purifies the water mm-hmm. because there's that churn. It, it, all of the particles, they, they fall, I guess. And I, I don't know the science behind it or anything like that, but it's it's the same thing in, in, in politics. It's like when we have these oligarchs, when we have these overlords that, that don't leave, then it, it just becomes toxic and it becomes mm-hmm. uh, not what we want, not what this country is founded on. Okay. Don't be afraid to vote for the third party candidates. People will try and shame you in saying things like, uh, you know, this side is still going to vote for this side and this side is still going to vote for that side. No, that's not true. You're seeing people fall away from both parties in in record droves. Um, red is just as guilty as blue and vice versa. Mm-hmm. My new favorite thing to tell everybody is red or blue, it ain't about you. <laughs> it's all about party politics, and that's what the founders warned us about. Yeah. Several times they warned us about that. That's because... You can look it up. Lots of people said it. Well, it's it's true. It just turns into political theater. and All of the problems that we're facing right now with the riots, with this with this pandemic all comes down to the Republicans and the Democrats' fault. It's all because of the two-party system. That's what it's gotten you. The erosion of your rights and the promise of further erosions. They'll promise you up and down at campaign time that they're going to do this and that. They're not going to do it. Especially if they've been there for more than two terms. Mm -hmm. I came up with the two terms. You know how? Mm Mm-mm. Oh, with Washington? George yeah, Washington he, he was the first down? president to serve two terms. And that was the example that he set. And he was very careful while, while he was in the office <clears throat> of the president. He knew that for generations to come until either the end of the, worth, the, end of the world or the end of the republic, that, that all of history would be rudely interrupted. Rude. Rudely. At um, 2.25 in the damn morning. <laughs> okay. Last last thing before we go. Um, do something. I, the last thing I would say is do, do something now. Um, it's easy to get good feelings and to be like, okay, yeah, I need to do something sometime. And then you procrastinate and then you never do anything. I've done that. You've done that. Mitch, have you ever done that? In school. <laughs> Um, yeah, just do, do something now, whether that's writing a representative, whether that's going and getting yourself a, a firearm or signing up for a C- uh, concealed carry class or whatever it is, getting some food storage, st- starting a garden, whatever it is, do something that'll make yourself more self-sufficient, do something that'll bring knowledge to yourself or your neighbors or your kids, do something that will, uh, express the desire for freedom to those around you, especially those in government. And rock the party? No. We don't do that anymore, Fred. Yes! No. How dare you? It wasn't cool when you said it in high school, like 20 years ago. <laughs> Almost 20 years ago. You're old. You know, this is our first and last podcast. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <sighs> 
I don't. I never said rock, rock the party in high school. I yes, that up. you did. No, I didn't. I picked that up from a dude from on my mission. One of my companions. Well, he was gay. <laughs> Love it. I said it after high school when we were eh, running around and being stupid before we got married. But in high school, I not never together. Did. We're not married to each other. <laughs> oh man, this is what happens at two thirty in the morning. I'm way too pretty for Fred, and he's jealous of my amazing beard. That I clipped my microphone to. You probably can't see it. See? Because you <laughs> couldn't hear it underneath it. <laughs> Do something. Get involved. Find a group that aligns with your values. Be prepared. Oh. Don't drop the phone. Okay. That's all I think. I think so. Be strong. Be of good courage. Fear not.